Let's uh, take a tour through a place, a beautiful place, called the Presidential Traverse, which is one very famous section of the White Mountains National Forest in central New Hampshire. So, the Presidential Traverse is a sequence of alpine or above tree line mountain peaks in central New Hampshire. It's actually not a particularly long hike but it packs a whole lot of forestry management issues into one little space. It's about 23, 24 miles long. So in other circumstances, folks would plan to cover that kind of a distance if they're well conditioned and provisioned in one long day or maybe two nice days and uh, one kind of chilly night. This takes most hikers two, three, four, or five days to do this particular 23 or 24 mile section. And the reason that it has a couple of different mileages associated with it is that there are multiple routes through this area. And we'll see why in a couple of minutes. So we'll begin our discussion down in the so-called Pinkham Notch area. Now in the Northeast, Notch is jargon or slang for a mountain pass which we understand topographically to be a saddle point where it goes up on two sides, that is up shoulder slopes towards nearby peaks, and down on two sides, down one valley on one side and down the opposing valley on the far side. So, the Appalachian Mountain Club's Pinkham Notch Visitor Center is placed right at the saddle point of Pinkham Notch. Let's zoom in a little bit more and see what's going on there. So the idea with Pinkham Notch here is this is a highly visible, um, fairly large operation. It's also a fairly successful operation for all of the visitation pressures and challenges that they have to deal with. So here at the Pinkham Notch Visitor Center, we have a couple of things going on. We got the highway running right up the center line of the valley connecting this area to nearby towns and villages like Gorham, New Hampshire. We'll get back to Gorham in a bit. But here at the Visitor Center, this is a classic and pretty functional example of forest co-management. There are a bunch of different players here. So we've got the U.S. Forest Service. Again, we're talking about White Mountains National Forest, so the Forest Service has to be a player here, one of the key players. The Appalachian Trail runs along the ridge line in the background at the upper edge of your screen here. And that is, let's see if we can get that going. That is this ridge line kind of up here, right at the top of the screen. That's the Presidential Traverse. And the thin little strip that is the Appalachian Trail along that ridge line and connecting those peaks together, that's run by the US National Park Service as a national scenic trail. Now, there are other players involved as well. New Hampshire State Parks, like Crawford Notch State Park just up the way, um, also help to provide visitor services and kind of launching off points for some of these different routes that you can take along the Presidential Traverse. So they need to be in the loop on communication for when do these trails open? When do we need to close them? Who can help out when we have a search and rescue or emergency exfiltration situation with an injured or lost or exposed visitor? And finally, other than two federal agencies, a state agency, the state park system, and um, we've got the not-for-profit, the Appalachian Mountain Club, which is the nominal owner and operator of the Pinkham Notch Visitor Center. So that's the AMC in the name. AMC does a whole bunch of cooperative management here in the sense that AMC organizes not only visitor provision, they run basically a little hotel and cafeteria and visitor center here at Pinkham Notch. And that helps a whole lot of visitors experience this area safely because they don't have to go out and camp using skills that they may not have. They also do crazy amounts of trail work. So they organize teams of people and not just volunteers, but paid crews that their entire job is just to manage this section of trail and maintain it and um, field folks like ridge runners whose entire job is to basically walk the trail back and forth, assist visitors, make sure nobody gets lost, answer questions, make sure people have enough food and water, provide emergency supplies and help when they run across folks. 
They're a little bit like park rangers without the park ranger title. So as you're thinking about future job options from uh, launching out of your forestry major, this is one additional way if you're not particularly interested in working for a federal agency. Organizations like the AMC actually employ a lot of people. Okay, moving on. One other thing we want to note before we get up onto the Presidential Traverse is that the sides of this area, the cirques, that is, glacially sculpted U-shaped cross-section steep-walled valleys, are present all throughout this area. We're pretty high latitude around this area, and you can see that in winter and during ice ages, this would be the kind of place that would accumulate small glaciers very, very quickly. Those glaciers, in turn, very, very quickly sculpt out that characteristic U-shape that you can see on some of these calls or cirques, or steep-walled glaciated valleys. These areas are federally designated wilderness, like the Great Gulf Wilderness here that you're looking up. And the idea here is that these need to stay primeval, which is sort of an umbrella term for several technical aspects of wilderness management within forestry. That is, they need to be dark, need not to have a bunch of electrified lights and light pollution at night. They need to be quiet, meaning not a lot of industrial equipment building roads through places like this where that sound, that noise, that anthropogenic or human originated noise contribution to the soundscape can echo off of those call walls. This wilderness is also, frankly, wild. What that does is it kind of ties the hands of the Forest Service where they get um, sort of an eager beaver forester who wants to improve a place, cut in a bunch of roads, widen out the trails, pave the trails, put in steps and handrails and so forth. The idea behind wilderness designation is to make sure that certain places stay wild, that they stay difficult, that, as John Muir once said, we have places to play in as well as to pray in. He understood that forest recreation is about more than just breaking a sweat and seeing some pretty places. Okay, so keep in mind that as we are going through this, this is a national forest, and a large chunk of this area that you see on screen right now is wilderness as well inside that national forest. It's an additional, more restrictive designation for a higher standard of preservation instead of conservation land use. So let's say you start your trip at Pinkham Notch Visitor Center down in the valley. You have a couple of options for getting up on the ridge. The first is Huntington Ravine. This is one of the most difficult and dangerous sections of trails in the United States and in the world. So it doesn't quite match up with places like Mount Everest where avalanches, earthquakes, terrorists, and lack of oxygen can all kill you. But the trail slope here is well over 100% and in places up over 200%. That is up over 45 degrees, up over about 75 degrees. And that is very, very steep. This qualifies as a non-technical rock climb or a scramble uh, under the Yellowstone, excuse me, the Yosemite climb rating system. And Huntington Ravine is lots and lots of fun. For people who enjoy backpacking and hiking, this is on a lot of bucket lists or life lists for people to check out. So this is a short, quick way up the mountain. That's only a couple of miles, but it is very, very challenging. Even if you are properly kitted out with lightweight gear and you are properly physically trained and acclimated to the elevation and so forth. Huntington Ravine is burly. And you can see in places, even in this leaf on summer aerial imagery, there are snowfields here. There are crazy people who go skiing here. So in June, when we visit this area for summer camp, uh, every time we do so, we see people backpacking snowboards up from Pinkham Notch Visitor Center to head up to this vertical little snowfield here just to say that they went snowboarding in June. Why? Well, that's a bucket list thing for other people. Okay, so another option beyond Huntington Ravine, if that sounds a little bit too hairy for most folks, and it is, is Tuckerman Ravine. This is another place where people are uh, backpacking snowboards and so forth to go 
dropping down sort of this old rotten snow, you can see a bunch of the lines here, going straight down slope. And you see the stream draining those. This is that characteristic opaque gray glacial milk, or ice melt water, with colloidal clay particles that take forever and a day to settle out. Okay. This is another extremely, extremely difficult and for some people dangerous section of trail, but a very famous hike as well. A lot of people are not comfortable with taking on that level of challenge, and so instead they'll do things like this. A much more common approach for most people is to take one of these several ridgeline trail approaches up to Mount Washington, which is the first major peak in the Presidential Traverse. So, we've got these old school kind of ridgeline trails, and they run right along the spine of the ridge. In steeper places where we don't have an alluvial angle for the talus and scree sort of falling off the sides of this hydraulically eroded uh, shoulder slope, these can be called knife edge ridge trails, where the trail is only a couple of feet wide, maybe a meter wide or two and it drops off with a cliff on both sides. So some of the other example uh, sites that we're looking at for this class have those knife edge ridge trails like Haleakala National Park. And in some cases the cliffs dropping off the side of the trail are hundreds or up to a few thousand feet in drop. So knife edge ridges are lots and lots of fun. Very, very exciting. This is not one of those, but it's close. So we see folks heading up and I straight up the side slope and you see them picking their way as carefully as they can up the loose rock and then once they gain the ridge line sticking on the ridge line because human instinct is to get to a high point and be able to see we're basically like cats out in the wild we'd like to be elevated so that we can see predators and beautiful views and take selfies with duck lips and selfie sticks and fall off of cliffs what was the question anyway so we get up on these old school ridgeline trails and in places the trails start to drop off of that ridgeline even just a few feet left and right or several dozens of meters left and right off of the ridgeline as you're ascending these are switchbacks or climbing turns so switchbacks are hard z-shaped zigzags climbing turns are more soft c-shaped lines so we see climbing turns in equestrian and mountain bike trails where they can't make hard turns. Um, horses need to be able to see 100 to 150 feet above, uh, excuse me, ahead and behind them at all times as prey species. So they do not do well with switchbacks. And you'll see at the very minimum for equestrian trails, uh, landings where they can reach a point at the end of the Z-shape, kind of that sharp tip, and turn around safely in that wide sort of flattened platform area and attack the next section of the switchback. Now for us as hikers this is not an equestrian trail, it's way 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 too steep. Uh, horses as a rule, as pack animals, cannot tolerate more than a 15% running trail slope which is not particularly steep but you notice it if you're walking it. This is well above that. This is closer to in some sections again a hundred percent slope. More than six times the maximum what a horse can handle safely with the rider on or loaded down with trail working equipment for example. So we see these climbing turns where the Appalachian Mountain Club and consultant with in consultation with the National Park Service's uh, trail shop they're starting to replace sections of the trail that running that are running straight up slope and are functionally stream beds in terms of channel morphology and forest hydrology. These climbing turns, these zigzags, these switchbacks break up the ability of water to run straight down the spine of the slope. It's hard to drain water off of a ridgeline slope, which is why we don't build trails like that anymore. But a lot of these trails are over a hundred years old, and so they're replacing or uh, redoing sections of them as they need to a little bit each year, but keeping the same overall trail alignment. Okay? Now, just a couple of uh, forest soils terms for us. This is what a scree field looks like. This is coarse fragments and materials uh, weathered off mechanically. So there's a lot of freeze-thaw action up here, even into the summer months. Um, the 
The weather can include things like thunder snow in this area during summer months uh, instead of thunderstorms. So when ice infiltrates through cracks in the bedrock matrix and then freezes before it gets too far down into the rock below sort of the permafrost line, um, we have water expanding. It's one of very few fluids in the universe that expands when it freezes. Most materials contract as they freeze. Um, and so what that does is it splits apart even solid bedrock. You cannot, cannot resist that expansion that's happening at a fundamental atomic level. So what that does is it breaks up sort of the skin of the bedrock into these loose fields of just kind of rubble, coarse fragments, material, anywhere from uh, anything from sand size particles on up. Anywhere there's a crack, this will get after it. And this is granitic geology, primarily, so um, there's a lot of large or coarse grained crystals, and the water will try to work its way into the cracks or seams between individual crystal grains in this granite, and that's how all the stuff starts sloughing off. So, Scree fields are where the stuff sort of builds up in flatter areas, and then talus slopes are where that scree starts to um, slide down the side of the mountain. So you can see those scree fields up above treeline, and they're also below treeline, it's just harder to see uh, on aerial imagery, you can see it down on the ground. This is loose, it's shifting as you're walking on it, it's uh, highly erosive, pretty fun, but highly erosive and not particularly safe. So again, in the flat areas, this stuff kind of piles up and then eventually gets moved off down slope as it gets closer to the edge of the angle of repose, which is the natural angle, typically 45 degrees for sand particles and larger, that alluvium, or loose coarse fragments, will, if it's steeper than that, slide a little bit down slope when pushed a little bit by the wind or by freeze-thaw action or overland flow. Um, where it's not quite that steep, it piles up into scree fields. Where it is that steep, we get talus slopes. And sort of the hot version of that, which is landslides, like in this spot right here. Now, these talus slopes are just fantastically dangerous to walk across. This is... This is a bad deal if you ever find yourself on one of these. This is tough even for some mountain goats and doll sheep, for example. But it's especially dangerous for everybody down slope of you. So occasionally, occasionally AMC Ridge Runners and National Park Service patrol rangers on the AT will need to interdict folks, uh, guests, hikers that are throwing rocks down slope and triggering landslides atop other people. Uh, this doesn't happen all the time, but it does happen. And in places like the Grand Canyon, where you can toss a little pebble over the lip and then just kind of forget about it, well, that pebble hits terminal velocity and atmosphere a couple of hundred miles an hour and goes right through somebody down below who has no idea that there's a rock flying at them. Um, so landslides are absolutely a thing, and you can visibly see evidence of that all over the place in this area. So active erosional processes, kind of reshaping, sculpting, eating away at the face of the presidential range. So here's another view of a later section of the approach trail climbing straight up the face of the ridge line. You can see how, if you kind of squint a little bit, this doesn't look any different than a creek bed because with a combination of the soil, the coarse fragments that are removed by active water erosion down the trail um, by our hiking poles, pushing them down the trail by our lug boot soles, pushing them down the trail, and combining that with the subsidence effect, that is compacting the fragments that do stay underfoot, pushing them down, pushing them together, getting those coarse, you know, those large pore spaces, those macro pores between those particles, crunched down and solidified a little bit, um, not, not adhering to each other, just loosely packed uh, as much as we can. That's called subsidence. So we combine erosion and subsidence, and we get that scooped out U-shaped cross-section in a trail, which looks a lot like a stream bed from a distance. Because when it rains, it is a stream bed. And when it's running straight up the slope, you cannot get that water to go anywhere else. So trails running straight up the slope, that is a zero degree 
trail slope alignment angle. And we'll talk about what that is in class. A zero degree trail slope alignment angle. There's no difference between the direction the trail is running and the direction that the slope is running or the slope's aspect. It's the same compass reading. That is a stream bed by definition. It's a fall line trail because you get waterfalls in it. Okay, moving on from that. People work their butts off for hours and hours and get to the top and struggle mighty hard. Yes, very exciting. You get rewarded with these beautiful views of some of the other presidential peaks, not along this presidential traverse. So you can see Mount Eisenhower in the background and Mount Jackson. And you can also see way off in the distance a guy who was never quite our president but helped America become a place that needs presidents, Mount Lafayette for Marquis de Lafayette, a French uh, partisan who helped us in our early American history. All right. So we get up to this first kind of prominence or local high spot and celebrate, but yeah, we haven't actually made it to the top, not by a long shot. We've still got hours to go, lots of sweat equity to put in. So now we are looking over to the right side or uh, to the kind of northeast of us here. This is one of those ravines. Remember, this is another way that folks can come up. And you can see here just a little bit how incredibly steep these glacially sculpted walls are. Tuckerman Ravine is a beautiful and stark and unforgiving spot. Also kind of dangerous, but worth it. Okay, so we move on and we head on up the mountain. And you can see up in this scree field area, we are now well above tree line. The crumb holes are those trees that are tiny, sort of dwarf birch, uh, beech, black spruce, balsam fir, those kind of species up here in the northeastern boreal forest. They can't hang on because up here, we're actually fairly close to where the jet stream dips pretty close to the surface of the earth. So Mount Washington, which we'll be up at in a moment, is the site of the worst weather statistically on the face of the planet like it's harder up here it's nastier up here than it is on top of everest and k2 and kilimanjaro pretty wild because weather intersects with topology here excuse me topography here in such an intense way so these trails can reach negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit to negative 60 degrees Fahrenheit, including wind chill, in the winter. And that is lethal within minutes without protective gear. So, one forestry job in this area is to be an overwinter hut caretaker working for the AMC. And these folks have to use basically the equivalent of a terrestrial spacesuit um, because it's almost hard vacuum-like conditions. Uh, the Even physically breathing in the air without a temperature regulator, passive or active, so electrically charged or not, um, to warm up the air and humidify it. If you are just breathing in negative 60 degree air, you can freeze lung tissue solid in the exact same way for men. Um, if you've ever been hiking out in the very cold weather, and your breath condenses, your fully saturated breath coming out of your nose and your mouth uh, sort of condenses and then freezes on your mustache or your beard. Imagine that happening happening to your alveolar sacs inside of your lungs with each breath. It's, it's a pretty effective way to die pretty quickly and uh, excruciatingly painful. So, they have to wear protective equipment, but on the upside, you pretty much have that hut to yourself. If you are a strong introvert kind of forester and you like outdoor recreation and hiking and so forth, think about being an AMC hut caretaker over winter. It's a blast. Okay, so now we are heading up the approach trails up Mount Washington, which is the highest of the peaks in this particular area. And in order to get people safely there, there's no vegetation for us to run these trails through. And from air, this aerial imagery, you can see what the trail looks like. It's slightly lighter colored, kind of these serpentine lineal features. But when you're standing real close in, um, you know, if your head's only about two meters above the ground and or a meter and a half above the ground if you're not super tall, um, it can be hard to pick out the trail for, from step to step. And so they mark the trail 
Uh, here on this particular spot, if you can see it behind the text of this label, it's just that little black shadowed thing. That's a pile of rocks called a cairn. And different places use different styles of cairns, uh, some with a pair of posts and then a flat rock called a lintel, and then a long skinny rock uh, that points in the direction of the trail. Others use stacks of rocks. Um, those are way markers or reassurance markers that blazes or uh, paint markings on forested trails take the role of elsewhere and at lower elevations. So trail markings, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun to kind of go on a scavenger hunt. Basically, from anywhere that you are on the trail, you should always be able to see a cairn up ahead of you telling you where you are going and a cairn behind you, if you look back over your shoulder, telling you where you've been. And when the snow starts piling up, the white paint blazes painted on these cairns Let's get pretty hard to see. What could possibly go wrong? All right, so winter travel in a place like this requires some uh, additional dedicated skill and planning and logistics and so forth to know exactly what you're doing, how you're gonna get there and so forth. So from here, we head up the mountain and it's still pretty darn steep even though it's starting to mound out and flatten out up towards the top. And finally, we pop out on the top of Mount Washington, only to find that it's not a mountain peak. It's a visitor center. So there's a road. There's a railroad. It's a cog railroad. Pretty cool. It uses a gear instead of wheels to climb its way up the mountain. There's a little visitor center here, gift shop, cafeteria, flush toilets. Super nice. Uh, pretty fancy weather station. This is the spot of the highest recorded wind speed on the surface of the earth. Uh, about as fast as a peregrine falcon dives while hunting, 255 miles an hour. Very cool stuff. This is over a mile in elevation, 6,200 feet, and almost 6,300 feet. And Mount Washington is a pretty heinous place. The weather here changes rapidly, and it can be deadly even in summer, summertime. I mentioned things like thunder snow. Imagine being outside during lightning weather in summer here but the views are absolutely spectacular. Look at that, 360 degree vistas. So now from this vantage point, we can see why it's important that the White Mountains National Forest Management Team and their planners in particular designated a bunch of the forested side slopes of these areas as wilderness. Because if we had a bunch of billboards and nightclubs and you know, 10,000 watt xenon searchlights from car dealerships and stuff like that. A lot of the urban light and sound and air pollution that we kind of take for granted in places like Los Angeles, those would be pretty inappropriate here. And the high elevation and high winds would mean that people up on Mount Washington, people breathing deeply to travel at elevation across this area and exert to climb up and down these mountains, well, they would have we would have some real danger and difficulty in terms of respiratory distress. So in places like Great Smoky Mountains National Park, hundreds of miles to our south in Mount Washington, of Mount Washington, there's a, a thin brown haze line on the horizon where the entire Tennessee Valley's uh, car exhaust, diesel exhaust, uh, in particular coal-fired power plant exhaust, all of that is blowing across your face when you're standing at the ridge on um, the Great Smoky Mountains, and that is difficult and can actually cause respiratory attacks for people who have to go to the hospital if they are respiratory compromised. So this year with COVID-19, that's kind of forefront in everybody's mind, and as a country, we're going to have to have more of a talk about what we are willing to put up with in terms of air pollution, the, the trash that we are blasting into the air and into our own faces. What are we willing to put up with and trade off? Okay, so... Mount Washington, a wonderful, beautiful, amazing place. Okay, let's get back to our tour. There we go. So I mentioned that for Mount Washington, we have a couple of options to get up. We've gone through a couple of the different trail approaches, but there are also others. And the Mount Washington Road is kind of expensive 
but this is the way that most people experience the summit because hiking up to the summit is an all day commitment to get up and back down but driving up the road not so bad good and you and so forth so folks can pay it's I think it's between 30 and 50 bucks depending on the size of your vehicle or you can take another option from the side and take the cog railroad so this is a historic way that mining has taken place we use cog railroads to get up slopes of more than a few uh, degrees or percent slope because you need the teeth of the cog to bite into the specialized rail system so this is a so-called narrow gauge rail system and these days it just takes visitors up and down um, it's lots of fun and there's an old tradition of Appalachian Trail through hikers who are walking along the trail here uh, they'll pass close to the cog railroad so they'll moon the cog railroad and if they're not doing so from a safe distance the Cog Railroad engineers have a long-standing tradition of throwing chunks of hard coal at their butts as hard as possible, and allegedly that hurts quite a bit. Um, I have, I would never do that. Your professor would never be so undignified as to do this and get nailed by coal. Of course, uh, a friend told me about it. Honest. Friend of a friend. Moving on. So. Now from Mount Washington, we're actually on our presidential traverse. So a, a traverse is something that is a trail hike that strings together a whole bunch of mountain peaks. So here again, we have the ridgeline trail option. And we also have a side hill trail option, which is the much more heavily used option now because that's a gazillion times more sustainable and less expensive to manage and maintain than the ridgeline option. So with the ridgeline option, you have 360 views pretty much all the time, but the trail is always going to be in the worst possible condition. You are maximally exposed, maximum subsidence plus erosion, maximum you're walking along a stream bed the whole time with wet feet and everything slippery and muddy. It's a disaster. But side hill trails, well, they've got a little upslope and a little bit of downslope that you can work with as the trail maintainer and make the trail kind of meander upslope a little bit, meander downslope a little bit, upslope, downslope. And we'll see some more examples of that up ahead. Those meanders help us to drain water off the trail instead of having the water entrained and flowing along the trail. This is what that looks like up close. See how there's this constant serpentine weaving left and right, up and down? This is how a good side hill rolling grade reversal and rolling grade dip trail system keeps you from having to do a whole bunch of maintenance all day, every day for the rest of time. So we walk along and we get to the next peak, Mount Jefferson. But here we notice an interesting thing. So the trail is actually, the main trail is off to the right. Again, this is the Appalachian Trail, but it's also the Presidential Traverse Trail. It has multiple names and multiple side trails spurring off of that, going down into each call or basin or steep walled area, dropping down to various points like Pinkham Notch, uh, and so forth. Side trails go up to the top of Mount Jefferson, because in order for us to approach a mountain peak without using a gazillion switchbacks or climbing turns that will increase the length of the trail quite a lot, we can do a short, highly erosive, and maybe armored up side trail spurring from the main travel trail with a side hill sustainable position and fully benched trail construction straight up that short slope up to the top of Mount Jefferson and then straight back down and we know that this short section is just going to be nasty in terms of trail condition and safety and maintenance cost and all of that but we also know that visitors have a huge motivation to get up to the top of Mount Jefferson and take in those beautiful 360 panoramic views. So, it's very common here in the Northeast to see a trail going up the North Face, the East Face, the South Face, and the West Face of each peak respectively because people want to come at each of these peaks from all sides. And it's lots of fun, but it's maximum possible trail maintenance and expense. And this is all uh, sweat of your labor, carry the tools out there by hand kind of th environment. That's why we use little side trails instead of running the proper trail across every peak. 
This also builds in a little bit of safety margin for us as we do the exercise of thinking about how thousands of people are going to go along this trail. And since the weather conditions can change so rapidly, forcing everyone to only have the option to go over every peak is kind of the maximum danger and exposure option. So giving the people the ability to skirt around a particular peak and maybe wait a few hours for things to clear out, blow through, and get blue sky weather once again, that's giving people a very safe and wise option, as well as being the more sustainable trail layout approach. So it's a win-win. We don't get a lot of those in forest recreation management, so we have to take them when we do. Some of the views off of Mount Jefferson include Mount Cabot. So if you've ever had Cabot Creamery cheeses, well, this is the area you're coming from. So we're in New Hampshire, and we are looking over to Vermont. Pretty cool stuff. So this is where topography and air quality resources and air sheds combine to give us so-called landscape views and vista resources. So Mount Jefferson is not just a mountain. It's also a collection of spots where you can view places like Mount Cabot off there in the distance, kind of behind this little information note card here. And if this is hazy and disgusting air quality, then that resource, that vista point that people have come so hard, so far for, worked so hard to reach, that's degraded. And this is a wicked problem in the sense that that airshed is beyond the bounds of White Mountains National Forest, sort of this green forested area up front. And then there's small towns in the valleys all throughout. So the White Mountains National Forest staff can't directly manage air quality. We just have to put up with whatever we receive from up airshed in the same way that folks who live at the mouth of a river have to accept whatever water quality they get from folks up watershed. Difficult problem, expensive to manage, long term this is never going to go away, and the stakes are high. So this qualifies as one wicked problem. Continuing on past Mount Jefferson, we head to Mount Adams and the beautiful views up here. And at this point, hopefully folks are feeling pretty good about their hike. We are more than halfway through and starting to get views of places like Berlin, New Hampshire, which is a place where you can head down after your hike or launch from before your hike. These gateway communities and northeastern New England uh, small towns do a lot of community forest use and management, a lot of people heating with wood, which has some air quality impacts. Dropping down off the mountain, we see where people actually get to do their camping. So this is the Valley Way tent site, and you can see the access trail running along just off the spine of the ridge. Again, so this is a side hill layout for sections of it. Even if it's five meters off the actual ridge line, that's enough side slope to effectively drain it. So that's what we see these trails getting relocated to as we go. So these mountain peaks are extremely exposed. They are dangerous to camp on. If there's lightning or killer winds or hail or extremely cold conditions or any combination thereof, you're gonna die up there. So. What the Forest Service and the Park Service and the Appalachian Mountain Club and the State Parks of New Hampshire have all worked together to do is identify a bunch of sane tent sites. So these typically include raised tent boxes, like garden boxes. Uh, they're dimensional lumber like railroad ties or pressure treated lumber set in a box format and then filled and compacted real hard with locally available soil from so-called borrow pits to elevate people up off that fragile erosive subalpine soil and through hikers for example have to hike maybe a mile sideways out this trail to get to the valleyway tent site and then the next morning hike a mile back and upslope to get back to the actual Appalachian Trail but this is the sustainable way to handle people along this area because it's so exposed and ecologically and for human survival reasons we can't have people camping along the AT up here. It's just too dangerous. The reason that we have to do those expensive tent site areas 
basically developed campgrounds up at altitude is because of spots like this. So this alpine pond is extremely fragile ecologically. The species that are dependent on this are really just trying to hang on by the tips of their talons and claws. So the reason it's so fragile is that there's a very short growing season, of course. It's highly exposed to the elements. The temperature swings here are enormous. It can be up to 75 degrees in a day. And so 75 degree temperature swing, not 75 degree temperature high. It very rarely hits 75 up here. But there's no outflow for the stream. So whatever chemicals that we pee or poop or wash off into this alpine pond, those are going to accumulate. The water will evaporate, the chemicals stay. And so they concentrate and concentrate and concentrate. Just like when we have a toxic algal bloom in a pond or at the beach, and people grab a pot full of water to boil and sterilize, that boiling kills off anything that's living in that water, but it also concentrates the chemicals in that water by removing some of the water and keeping the concentration of, keeping the amount of those chemicals in it. So at a larger scale, that's what happens with this entire pond when people uh, take a quick polar bear plunge dip or ice water challenge dip to just kind of rinse off, scrub off, shriek, and then throw their quick dry clothes back on. Their salts, their sunblock, their bug spray, all of that stuff is getting washed off into this and stays there. And it's invisible to the human eye uh, up until the point that it's so completely destroyed that the water is beautiful and clear and there's nothing growing in it because nothing can grow in it and it's scenic but toxic and dead. So, as a result, forest managers typically restrict at-large camping or self-directed or self-chosen campsite camping around alpine ponds out to a quarter mile radius or more because some studies have shown that, for example, our fecal coliform, our E. coli, and our poop can travel over land during large rain events up to a couple of miles down slope, believe it or not, before sunlight sterilizes it or it gets entrained in the soil sediment and just safely isolated there. Sometimes it does get washed all the way down and causes health problems for people trying to get their water there. Tricky, tricky management problems relative to a pretty borderline ecosystem up here right above, right below tree line. So this big structure, this basically it's another visitor center, is called a hut. It's a visitor lodge that has a tiny little gift shop. It's got a big kitchen and a mess hall or cafeteria area, and then a whole bunch of bunk rooms. And the rooms are extremely expensive. They can be up, a, up to a couple of hundred dollars per night. And you had to walk yourself here with your backpack and your gear for the privilege of being able to experience that $200 or $250 room per night because all of the stuff here, all of the toilet paper, all of the food, and so forth, that all has to get backpacked up on the backs of employees. So there are access trails running to each of these from the nearest uh, trailheads. These are steep, difficult trails. You can see one here. Which goes right down the slope and out to nearby staging area that the AMC runs to get supplies back to, backpacked up to these spots. But the Forest Service, AMC, New Hampshire State Parks and so forth and the Park Service use these sites as concentrated sacrifice zones, so to speak. So the whole area around here is bare, it's trampled, it's denuded. Um, we have some tent camping spots kind of nearby to this in suitably hardened spots. What the foundation of the structure does, what the roof does, and all of that is it physically separates us, it elevates us when we want to throw down our sleeping bags on the bunks and cots from this highly erosive soil, this low biological activity soil, and protects it by concentrating all of that impact right here inside these walls. And everything else around it, as you can see, is doing okay. And by doing okay, we mean marginally kind of hanging on right at tree line. These are not big trees. This is right at the threshold of full-size uh, subalpine and montane boreal forest composition up to crumb holes. So within a couple of hundred meters, these dwarf trees can be only a couple of feet high and maybe over a hundred years old. They're just, they're doing everything they can to put on a couple of extra twigs each year for growth instead of entire boughs and branches and expanding the entire bowl. 
So, these sites are expensive, they're beautiful, they're lots of fun, great views. The staff are typically very friendly and uh, motivated to work there. It's a good scene for everybody involved. Mount Madison is our last big peak on the Presidential Traverse, and as we hit the Mount Madison peak, we're starting to look ahead to where the Appalachian Trail continues. So you can see the trail going up over the sort of nose of Mount Madison there, and then dropping fairly quickly down the shoulder ridge towards the base of, for folks who want to go that direction, uh, the Mount Washington Auto Road. Also, just down below tree line, we can see the Osgood tent site and the Bluff tent site. Again, these are to get people off of the Alpine section, which is so incredibly dangerous and fragile at the same time. The Appalachian Trail continues after crossing the highway and the drainage down in the valley on towards Wildcat Mountain and Carter Dome and Middle Carter Mountain. There's a whole sort of roller coaster of sequential peaks up along Carter. And through hikers are thinking along those lines. Everybody else is thinking along the lines of heading to one of these gateway communities like Berlin or Gorham, New Hampshire, where folks can head to hiker hostels, where there are a lot of forest rec and forest management oriented businesses to support visitors to the area, and so forth. So grocery stores are accustomed to seeing hikers. They stock the things that uh, cross-country skiers need in the winter, the hikers need in the summer. Everything sort of works together when the local private businesses can coordinate well with the Forest Service and the Park Service and so forth in terms of things like seasons and temporary closures like for COVID-19 and so forth. When everybody's communicating well, businesses profit and provide much needed services for visitors and the Forest Service and the Park Service profit or benefit, not profit. Uh, the federal government is not in competition with private businesses and everybody sees a well-supported, well-trained, well-informed, well-taken-care-of visitor able to safely and effectively enjoy the Presidential Traverse, a very, very fragile alpine ecosystem as effectively as possible without causing undue impacts. We can never set it up so that there are zero impacts, but we can minimize and mitigate those impacts really pretty effectively when things are firing on all pistons. Now consider how close southern New Hampshire is to places like New York City. So this is a fairly isolated spot in central New Hampshire, but millions of people live within a day's drive of this. It's busy and popular. so. The consequences are high if we don't think through all of these things beforehand and get good policies and forestry practices in place. Okay? So, that was our tour of the White Mountains Presidential Traverse. I hope you enjoyed it. And here's what it looks like from above. It's sort of this really cool 22, 23 mile long C shape. And... Lots of people have enjoyed it because lots of foresters have worked really hard to make it safe and enjoyable, but also sustainable. Resource protection and visitor experience are the two main prongs of the U.S. National Park Service's explicit mission. Thanks.